you expect to hear something, it's probably because you believe in Bigfoot. You never know. We might just hear a rap, rap, rap right back at me. The hairy hominid himself, Bigfoot, Sasquatch. And before you say absolutely not, all I ask is that you listen to the rest of this program about Bigfoot. I, myself, have seen something, and I'll tell you about that in just a little while. But right here, in this very patch, on this very piece of property, you can hear the automobiles going by in the distance. It's not like that at night. It's a very different world here in the dark. And one night, I had just got done with my evening walk through these very woods, covered with beautiful mountain laurel and rhododendron, and the red oak and the white oak and the mighty poplar tree, the bear, the coyote, the fox, the raccoon, the possum, the snakes, and everything else. There was something else that night following me. As soon as I had gotten back to our house, just a few hundred yards up that way, and got into the light, I heard it. A rap, rap, rapping on a tree right here. I was so startled I ran in and woke up Shelly and made her come out at about one o'clock in the morning to listen. She heard it as well. Friends, I'm not ashamed to admit that I would be the guy that dies very first in any horror movie because when I hear something like that, I go walking and I go looking. She had to restrain me. I had to know, you see. What could it have been? I'll tell you what I think it was at the very end. But until then, I would like you to join me on this journey. And all I ask is that you keep an open mind, just a smidge. Welcome to volume two of The Creeching Hour. This one might actually reach an hour. Ooh. If you're thinking to yourself, there's absolutely no possible way that there could be a Bigfoot living on this planet. We would have found him by now. I say contraire, mon frere. In fact, if you study cryptozoology, which is the study of hidden animals, you'll find that things like the panda bear, the acope, that beautiful relative of the giraffe in Africa, and even the beautiful panda bear weren't discovered until rather late. Even the cool little platypus, it looks like he's a mix-up between a bird and an otter. That's exactly what the scientists thought. The smartest and the most wise of those pith-hat-wearing do-gooders <laughs> and they thought it was fake clever taxidermy or an outright hoax nobody would believe such a thing they lay eggs you say what what it couldn't be yes it be and it could just be that there's other things out there will you birds stop scolding me please there's other things out there things that go bump in the night that our ancestors knew about then and we ought to still know about them some of us have closed our eyes to the possibility that something could be out there. And what if, dear friends, the bird isn't scolding me at all, but who really owns these woods? Better have a look, eh? Ooh. That little bird back there is scolding something, and I'm not so certain that it is me. Going back to when our ancestors sat around fires, they painted with burnt sticks and charcoal upon the walls pictures of creatures, many of those half man, half beast. All around the world, dear friends, Africa, Asia, into Europe, everywhere, just about every culture, every race of man has had stories of giants large hairy beasts small folk ghosts goblins things that go bump in the night many of these stories have evolved at the same time like some form of convergent evolution but in different places places that they said the people had no contact with one another what did ancient africa and the kingdom of zimbabwe have to do with the aztec empire Why would they have similar stories of similar beings? Why would the Aborigines, the, the Aboriginal people of Australia, why would they have dream time stories and paintings of half man, half ape? 
Every culture has these stories. We weren't mingling back then. There were no homing pigeons or, or birds that were soaring across the great expanse of the ocean or no bottles full of messages. But there were still the tales going back to the Egyptians and the Mesopotamians and farther back. Stories like Gilgamesh and the mighty Enkidu, said to be a hairy beast man. In some literature, even Grendel, mighty Grendel, was said to be something like us, something large or something hairier and more grotesque, something powerful with an insatiable appetite for human flesh. Mmm. What do all the stories have in common? I am absolutely certain of it. Bigfoot, or what we might call Bigfoot, exists, maybe even right here on this very patch in Western North Carolina. Maybe he's existed all along. Friends, I want you to understand something. We have shared this planet with sentient life before. The Neanderthals, Cro-Magnon, some would call them proto-humans, or I would just say they were different types of humans, like us, but not us. We know it because we interbred with Neanderthal. Their very DNA is in us, like my, well, my very caveman-like forehead and head, all lumpy and thick with bone. I'm fairly certain I have a fair bit of Neanderthal DNA in me. I even like clubs and hammers. But all jokes aside, why should it be so strange, dear friend? For you to believe now, as you did when you were a child. Why is it so strange to believe that we still share this planet with other sentient life? Neanderthals were like us in many ways. They cared for their living and their dead. They had expansive burials. We know this because we find their bodies torn and mangled by the time they hit 30. If one were to hit my ripe old age of 45, they would be ancient beyond their years. I hear something in the distance, something trotting around. What could these stories mean then? They're either true, or they're a hoax, or they're a cross between those. I'll be right back. There are four, possibly five, species of great ape on our planet. The gorilla, the chimpanzee, the orangutan, the bonobo, and us, if you put us in the family of the great apes. We do know that we are very closely related as far as genetics go. And um, what if there's something else out there, something that has survived? I've worked with chimpanzees, and I could tell you stories that would absolutely horrify you with some of my encounters with chimps. Not only because of their ability, uh, violence, but they're so like us in so many ways that sometimes it's like looking through a very misty mirror, uh, seeing us or something like us in a new light. It rather is intimidating and also very enriching to work with the great apes. They have amazing senses, did you know this? Chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans. They are highly intelligent, some would say sentient. So much so that for a very long while, we have been looking and people have been fighting to try to classify them with the same broad brush as we're classified as sentient beings that we're self-aware and we understand. And they believe that they should be protected just like any other human. There's ongoing lawsuits on this right now. You can go to Google and have a look for those. Something has everything stirred up today. That's an old angry blue jay. And usually he talks like that when there's a hawk around or some sort of a predator. Now, they know that I'm no threat to them. But there's a lot of things that like a taste of bird. We have shared this planet with many different proto-humans, many different apes throughout history. Some scientists speculate that some of those apes could be, you know, front runners for who Bigfoot really is. And again, friends, every culture has its own hairy hominid, 
North America has a dozen or so. Asia has plenty, the Yerim, the Yeti. They're all over the world, all over the globe, the Yowie, uh, the Sasquatch, you name it. Every culture has theirs. I could establish that beyond uh, fact to you, friends. I could show you many different resources talking about these beings, going very far back, as I've already mentioned, to the Mesopotamian, even to the Egyptians. And we know their pantheon of gods, Horus and Anubis. We knew that they were highly anthropomorphic, that they saw the world through very spiritual lenses, and they believed that those things were very real and very present in their life, the old ways and the magics of the world. And we find the Bigfoot or something that passes for it, even in Egypt so long ago. They've never really left. And I challenge you with this, friends. I am certain that the many reasons we don't believe that this is one and possibly the greatest, because you hear all the junk all the time. Let's face it. How many times do you turn on or you see the National Enquirer or you see some book or some magazine, some Facebook article, something on YouTube, and it's a bunch of idiots in the woods, banging on trees, drunk as hillbillies. They've got the corn, whatever you, the corn liquor, whatever it is. And they're making fools of themselves. They're hoaxing things. Every, every year, some so-and-so comes out and says, I've got a Bigfoot in my freezer. You know, there were some guys just down the road, some, some, some drunkards in, <laughs> in uh, Georgia not too long ago. They took some road-killed possum and some butcher meat that had gone bad, and they filled up a freaking Wookiee suit from Star Wars. <laughs> Wookiee! And people believed it. And then when it all came out to be a hoax, everybody just thought, oh, there's no credibility in it anymore. Cryptozoology, the study of very real and very hidden animals, doesn't seem important anymore. People want the sideshow attractions. But the fact of the matter is, right here on this world, there are things that we have not classified, that we have not seen, that we have not written about, that we don't have any physical direct evidence of, but it doesn't mean that they're not living their best life. It happens all the time. Recently, with the Wallace's giant ground bee, some scientist had, had, had classified it as an extinct a very long time ago. An amazing bee. Beautiful. It looks nothing like a bee in some ways. But it is. And it is big, like Wallace said. And they're amazing. And they classified them as extinct. Oh, yes, they did. <clears throat> they weren't extinct. It just seems that nobody had seen them in so long that they just figured that they were. They even went looking. But they didn't know where to find them. If they had went to the locals, the natives, the natives would have said, Hey, guys, uh, you see, you're having trouble finding a, a giant bee. <laughs> it's quite colorful. It's very big. Why are you struggling? They would say, we've known about this bee forever. We call it this. And it lives in the termite mounds. It seals itself in with its family. And they would have known that, but the scientists never think to do that. They, they look down from their ivory tower and they say, this is what we know and this is what we don't know and there's nothing else to it. If they had only went to the people, they would have found out. And you know the trouble with cryptozoology? With, with the study of and the finding of these animals that are supposed to be extinct when you find them again? Now we just put them in trouble. We just put them in danger all over again. Do you know what's happening now to the Wallace's giant ground bee since it's been rediscovered? Come back from extinction? Never left. People are poaching them. $10,000 for a dead one on eBay. You can write your own check for a living one. They're so rare that everybody has to have it. Those wealthies, the ones that have everything. What will I get my wife now? I think I'll go and buy the rarest, possibly the very last... Of, of a species on planet Earth, and I'll have them encase it in some amber for you or something. We'll make a beautiful little pendant out of it. It'll be one of a kind, dear. I've been studying cryptozoology ever since I was knee-high to a woodchuck, and I can tell you this. If Bigfoot comes right now and says hello, I will probably delete this video, or I'll just let you think it's a hoax. Don't anticipate that happening, but you never know. I still hear something out there. Could Bigfoot have never left? Could our ancestors have been telling us things through stories like the epic poem Beowulf, or even the tale of Gilgamesh and Enkidu, or the tales in the Bible of giants, scary giants in the land of Canaan, some of them quite hairy, hmm? or possibly the Bigfoot. The many, many Native American cultures talk of different hairy beings, large beings and small. And I have friends right now, I want to tell you this for you skeptics, 
I have friends right now in Indonesia studying the Orang Pendak. Nobody took them seriously 15, 20 years ago before they found Homo floriensis on those islands of Flores in Indonesia, the Ring of Fire Islands. They found little tiny skeletons of little tiny proto-humans that lived just like us, that were smart just like us, but they didn't look anything like us. They were hairy little so-and-sos with long arms and only about three foot tall. Hobbit. Real hobbit. Hey, now. That was big, whatever that was. Well, you know what, Bigfoot? If you are out there, let's make a deal. I'll tell you what. You just come on out now and show yourself clean and true for our camera. I know you can understand, Creech. You know I'm like you. I swear to God, if you're a fat squirrel, I'm going to be very upset with you. And I'm going to come and steal your cachet of nuts and move them ten feet away and you'll never find them. Hmm. My great uncle's name is George. George Schaller. That's my last name. Spelled S-C-H-A-L-L-E-R. You can look up old George. He turned the world of cryptozoology and primatology on its head when he got into, of all things, Bigfoot research. That's right. This man probably has more awards than any scientist of our generation. He has literally written a book on panda bears, mountain gorillas, wolves, and African lions. He was the mentor of some of the greatest. Mrs. Fossey is one of those. He still is very, very much active in saving this planet, saving its animals, and he is my greatest inspiration. Yeah, very, very grateful for him. But when he studied the phenomenon of Bigfoot and the Yeti and some of the other ones, the Yeren of Asia and Bigfoot here in North America or Sasquatch, Boggy Creek, you know, whatever you want to call him, the big fellow. When he outright came out and said that he doesn't deny the possibility of the existence of Bigfoot, it shocked everyone. He has said that he wishes that there was more physical evidence to bear up to scrutiny, scientific scrutiny. But he did say he wouldn't close the door on the possibility of it. And this man knows more about primatology and primates than I would say just about anybody alive. For him to say that, he was so, and is still, so highly esteemed in the community that when people heard that, they all exclaimed, how could a real scientist even in any way believe this stuff or not outright deny it? Because, friends, he is a wise man. And like him, I would much rather believe everything and be made wrong than to believe nothing and be made right. But it wasn't until I had an experience. I've never really talked about it. I was going to save it for the podcast. But I did promise you that I would tell it to you. And I'd like to tell it to you now, if I might. It's about something that happened to me and a group of my good friends. None of us, except one of us, we're still best friends. But the rest uh, are our acquaintances. Mm -hmm. Two of them are very, very close. We were at Camp Miles. I grew up in a few different places, people often ask. I was born in the great state of Ohio on the Maumee River, the beautiful Maumee River. And I lived there for the first five or six years of my young life. But we traveled often and we moved to Naples, Florida. And uh, we always spent our summers in Rhode Island in a house that was built in 1776 on Bristol Bay. Oh, that house had some memories too. And I'll share about those someday soon on a podcast when we talk about the spookier side of things. I was a Boy Scout. Some of you probably are going, oh, that makes sense. Um, I didn't make it to be an Eagle Scout, to my shame. But I was also boxing and fighting at the time and involved in, uh, believe it or not, media. My very first speaking engagement was as our news anchor for our local high school, Laley High School. The Laley Trojans in Naples, Florida. We were smack dab in the middle of the ghetto. <laughs> I loved it, and I still do. I loved wrestling for them and uh, going to school there. I wasn't a great student. I was a social butterfly, believe it or not. 
But I was a Boy Scout, and I was a Life Scout at that, meaning that I was one step away from being an actual Eagle Scout, which I wanted to do. That summer changed my life forever and changed the life of my friends that were involved and some of the parents as well. High strangeness in the second largest working cattle ranch in the United States of America. It's called Bob uh, Babcock Ranch. We called it Bob's Cat Ranch, but Babcock Cattle Ranch. Huge expanse of scrubland and swamp. Beautiful area. We actually had our Camp Miles, uh, named after Miles. We, we had it right there in the middle of this ranch and it was spectacular. The wildlife was very, very amenable to us. Um, very interesting place at the time. This was a long time ago, friends. At the time, there was nothing really there but the camp. There was a place called the Octagon, which is, is still there. It's a, a big cat and an animal uh, research and um, rehab center called the Octagon. Really, really wonderful place. That factors into the story somewhat. We had had a really interesting evening. It was an Indian powwow, we called them. But the natives there, the Seminole Indians, the Miccosukee, some of my great friends, I love the people of the land so, so very much. The Osceolas, they're just wonderful people. And they know a great deal about the land. And we um, had a relationship with some of them and they um, would come to some of these powwows and we just had a great time. But there's this beautiful, if I could paint you the picture, there's a beautiful big lake. And I want you to understand how Florida is a little bit, a little bit wild. You hear all the Florida stories. We did our, our, our mile swim in that lake, teeming with American alligator, alligator Mississippiensis, big alligators. You know what we had for protection? We had a person in a canoe with us looking out for the big ones to make sure they didn't get in the water or they didn't get too close. They would push them away with a paddle if they had to. This is, this is true, people will tell you, corroborate. We would do our mile swim in this dark tea-colored water and we would see alligators for the whole, the whole time. But that night, as you look out this bleach seat, like um, bleachers, I guess you call them, stadium seating, where you're facing out over this beautiful expanse where the, the lake is right in front of you. And all the parents came in for this. It was like towards the end of our graduation ceremonies. And um, I'll never forget this night. The people were dressed up in their finest regalia. We were going to eat good that night, which was the only thing we cared about because we were starving in camp. And it can get rough, friends, like dysentery. You're roughing it in a third world country, rough in the Boy Scouts out there in Florida. The mosquitoes, the mosquito net never works. You, you get sick, you, you start to, your skin starts to slough off. If you're not careful, you can get very, very ill there. And I have. But that night, it was a golden night, graduation night. We all had a part to play. Some of us, the part like me, was just to sit there and do much of nothing, which I kind of like to do. So I sat there and I watched the reaction of the crowd and the participants as they danced around a gigantic bonfire with the, the firelight of the chicky huts. The chicky huts are these beautiful huts made of palmetto fronds, saw palmetto to be precise, and, and some other things, sable palm as well. But they cover up these huts in these beautiful leaves and they, they weave them in so thick that even the, during the worst summer thunderstorm in Naples, Florida, or Fort Myers, Florida, you can get underneath that chicky and you can stay dry. They're fantastic. I'll never forget the way that the firelight was glinting off of that and all the people. It seemed like something out of our distant past going back thousands of years almost as the dancers and the music. And then I see it, and I'm not the first one. A gigantic bull, American alligator, crawls from the lake. I kid you not, the cacophony of the people in the stands, everybody's freaking out. Alligator! But it was so loud, so loud at the base that you couldn't hear. The participants thought that they were cheering them on. They didn't know why they were yelling. They were doing their thing, you see? And this giant alligator, and there was only a few of us between the alligator and the people. So I run out, and later, friends, I lost my privilege to carry a, a, a walking stick because I sharpened it and I threw it and accidentally hit another scout. But that's neither here nor there. But that night, I surely had my stick, part of the reason I always carry one. And I ran up and I brandished it, and I popped that alligator in the snow, right there in front of everyone. And the alligator slid off into the water. It was an interesting night to say the least. I, I felt very, very pleased with myself that night. Um, only a few of the scouts saw it, but they were very grateful for me. The parents saw the alligator. They saw a lot of it from where I was. But it was a big alligator. Now, I'm not saying it was going to go after a scout, but it sure as crap looked like it to me. 
He was attracted by the music and the noise and the dancing and the firelight and the smell of the food that was cooking on the spits. This alligator was coming for business. Sometimes you're in the right place at the right moment, but I'm about to tell you what happened that night was definitely the wrong place at the wrong moment. We were very naughty children. I hate to, to break the illusion, friends, but I, I was a naughty child and we got into a lot of mischief. I might have looked like a scout and talked like a scout, but I had a gangster's heart. <laughs> I did. I've made my fair share of mistakes and I'm very grateful to be here alive with you telling you this story. That night, it could have went either way. We had snuck out that night, like we did most nights. These, these tents, we had these beautiful camp setups, picnic tables, looking out over the swamp, gorgeous. The tents were elevated because you never know, we can get a heavy rain and the water can come up. So they're built up on a platform, at least a foot off of the ground and they're wood. They're probably 10 foot by 10 foot square on their tent. They're enough for two scouts and all of their things and their netting and their, their cot and all of that. You're in a tent this whole time. You have an outhouse, a latrine, and uh, oh, I should tell you stories of teasing people. I used to have so much fun. My uncle had given me a wild boar head and I would sneak it to camp sometimes and I would go from camp to camp and I would push this giant wild boar's head in the back of the, the tents and <laughs> in the middle of the night and just terrify people. Or I would put snakes in the latrine. You know, all the types of fun things that, that people like myself, the creatures of the world that we like to do. That night, we decided to be bad kids and sneak out and try to steal. That's right. We were going to steal some pop, some soda pop from the local chicky. We had like a canteen or what would you call it a, uh, if it was in prison? It was more like prison. <laughs> Whatever you call that, it was that. And we would sneak down there. And our grand plan that night was to steal from, from the machine, to, to rock the machine. And let me just tell you, friends, do you know people die doing that every year? It's somewhere in the world. I want you to understand this, that this is a cause of death, rocking these machines. In Asia, in Japan, it happens quite often because they've got really good stuff in their machines. You can get a whole meal out of it. So it's not just like a little Coca-Cola machine falling on you. It's like, a, well, a P.F. Chang's falling on you, the whole thing. Kabam! You're gone. Really. So our grand plan was to steal some sodies. And uh, first it was putting our arms up there in a very freshman attempt to try to reach them. Oh, I can almost feel the can! You know, but you really can't feel the can. So the next thing was, let's tip it with... One or two of us in front holding it, of course. That way it doesn't tip too far. We just wanted to shake it up, you know, like that Taylor Swift song. Shake it up, shake it up. It didn't go our way. We thought of trying to jimmy a lock. We thought of a lot of things. We even thought of the old, the caveman approach, as I like to call it. There was a very large rock close by, and I was fairly certain that I could heave it right through the plywood. And just, they had like the bleacher thing where you, the, the thing comes down and they latch it. And I said, well, why, why worry with breaking the lock? They won't know who it was. Let's just throw this boulder through there. I'd already had the boulder on my shoulder before they stopped me. It would make too much noise. We're in the middle of the woods, you dummies. We stayed there for about 45 minutes or an hour, having fun. This was somewhere north of, uh, or somewhere around 2, 2.30 in the a.m. We've been gone for a while. We're carrying on and cutting up and having a good time. And we decided it was time to walk back. The long walk and the short walk, the walk that I'll never forget, the run, the terror. We hadn't gone too, too far when we all kind of, I'll never forget the feeling I think that came among all of us. We just suddenly hushed and got quiet. And when we got quiet, we realized that everything around us was quiet, which is very strange there in the swamps of South Florida. There's always some noise going on at night, always. The night insects, the night birds, the frogs, the reptiles and amphibians, even the mammals, always talking, always noisy neighbors. You don't hear so much the sirens and all the stuff you're hearing, even though we're in the middle of a patch of woods, we're still close to a town, a big one. Not so in some places and not so where we were that night. It wasn't long after that. We all had flashlights, but we were so accustomed. We hardly ever used the flashlights. And part of the reason was they sucked and we only really had one. You know, my parents would buy me these big clunky, I hated these things, but, but they were practical for someone like me, me who loses things and who drops things constantly. They were huge, about this big, and it was all battery and one tiny little bulb in it. You can get a little cheap one these days that I take caving and I take scuba diving and stuff. They would just blow it out of the water. 
But we're stuck with these big clumsy things. The only useful thing is you could use it to bludgeon to death something that attacked you. They were cumbersome, like the old video cameras back then. We didn't have our lights on when we first were aware that something, or someone, we assumed it to be someone, was following us. We heard in the distance the footsteps, and when we... Sounded like a footstep there. When we stopped, it stopped. And uh, we assumed, immediately among ourselves, we later said, that it was one of our one of our friends that we had invited to come along and they chose not to. Not because they didn't want to go and they didn't want to be in on the fun, but they chose not to because they wanted to be the fun. They wanted to prank us or something. So we carried on, no big deal. It was about that time that we began to smell something strange and I immediately thought brimstone like eggs. If you've ever had really eggy water, sulfur water, you know what I'm talking about or the smell of sulfur, the brimstony stink of a wet dog almost. To be quite honest, I was just assuming it was one of us. <laughs> We'd been out in the woods all week after all, and some of us weren't very hygienic. And then we heard something in the distance that I'll never forget. Almost a low hum. <clears throat> it's hard for me to even do it, but... Have you ever heard a polar bear purr? You should look it up. And polar bears, when they suckle, sometimes they'll have this rumble. Uh, polar bear purr It's the only way I know how to call it. I've heard it numerous times and it's beautiful. But that sound was vaguely like that in some ways. And we flashed the lights on, you know, and, and would shine it in the direction of the palmetto scrub, but anything could be out there. I mean, there's you know, seven foot tall shrubs, eight foot tall shrubs lurking, you know, very little open space. So none of us felt quite confident enough to go and investigate. I do very much remember my friend Chris, who will talk about this on the podcast. At one point he turned around and he said, what the F do you want? And he's showing the flashlight off in the distance and nothing. And we kind of kept going. We just figured whoever it was, you know, they would either try to scare us or they would just keep following us so we'd keep heading back. We turned our lights off and we continued on <clears throat> for a little while, and uh, the smell got stronger and the noise of it stalking us. It would be on one side and then it would be on the other and it was starting to worry us all, I could tell, but we still assumed, I think we all assumed, uh, that it was a person, <clears throat> somebody pulling our leg. So we also didn't want to look foolish when we're all... 14 years old, 15 years old. We all didn't want to look foolish in front of one another, certainly. So we carried on. And it was at that time that my friend that was at the rear, his name is Chris, the one that challenged it before. He's always had the, the mouth of the group. But he turned and he said, what the F is your problem? Because whoever it was or whatever it was had crept up very close this time, close enough that he could hear it breathing behind him. He turned, and when he did, we all turned as one. And what I saw that night has changed my life, literally forever. It looked like us. <clears throat> it, uh, it looked like us in some ways. It wasn't near as tall as I would have expected from the stories that I had read. I would have thought that Bigfoot or something like him would have been very, very tall, but it wasn't. It was about my own five foot eight to six foot at the very tallest. There was some hunch to his posture. Um, the, 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 the thing that is to me to this day, the most fascinating and horrifying thing is the look on its face, the look of its eyes. Um, the way that its mouth peeled back and I saw the white of teeth beneath. The, 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 the somewhat grin and grimace that I've seen before in some of the great apes, and I've also seen something very similar in humans. Whatever it was, was no orangutan. Bear in mind, friends, I grew up in a, a naturalist family. I grew up around chimps, orangutans. I grew up around these animals. I, I know 
what a chimpanzee and orangutan is. And what I saw that night, what we saw that night was no orangutan. Its posture was straight and pure. It had a little bit of a slump to its shoulders, very long arms, uh, long hair, longer than I would have anticipated, like a sheepdog long and matted around the corners. It's kind of like the old, uh, you can't see it right here, but I have an old climbing vine that goes up the tree. It's called poison ivy and it's furry. It was like that. It was thick and, and, and almost fibrous. In fact, when we first saw it there, if it had been standing in the palmetto, we wouldn't have even seen it. It seemed to be covered in something that appeared to be algae or even duckweed. I'll never forget that. Everything stands still in a moment like this. Everything. Time stands still. I could remember if a leaf fell from the tree, how slow it took to hit the ground. I can remember the looks. <clears throat> the looks on all of my friends' faces. We had no point of reference. We didn't know what we were looking at. How could we? But we were all shocked and absolutely stunned by what we were witnessing. Whatever it was, it wasn't it wasn't frightened, it wasn't hostile. It was it seemed almost as if it was a curiosity and almost 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 this this I can't even describe it. It's a look that I've seen before in people that are extraordinarily dismissive of you. If you're trying to tell them something and they just kind of give you the... Like, I've seen all this before, look. I don't know. Um, it was no ape. It's face, friends, I want you to understand. It's uh, It's face looked like you or me. It had a broad nose. It had lips similar to our lips. It had what appeared to be longer and shaggier ports, portions that might even pass for something that would look like an eyebrow, for God's sakes. Its eyes were huge and luminous. They cast no reflection from our torch, friends. And this is an important point that I want to tell you. What we saw that night, its eyes cast no shine. It had eyes like us. Eyes that could understand, that could see. And it saw that we were frightened of it. I, 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 I certainly, to this day, you cannot shake me on that, it saw that we were very frightened of it. And it was almost like this, this moment of this, 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 this gravitas, this yes, that it was almost happy that we got the point. I'll never forget when the spell was broken, it was almost as if, I don't want to tell who this is. It was the sound of one of our friends urinating himself that broke the spell. I want you to understand that this was so singularly terrifying that one of the scouts full on wet themselves. And I'll never forget when, when we, we kind of registered what was going on, you know, it, just, it was almost as if, if you've ever been in a near death situation, which I have, whether it was caving, whether it was near a crocodile, whatever, a shark in the water when I got rammed by the tiger shark, I'll tell you about that sometime. That happened in Naples, horrible. But time does really not stand still, but your perspective of time stands different. That's the only way I can describe it. Um, when the crocodile or the alligator came for me, I could see as the water droplets came towards me as in slow-mo, almost like from the X-Men movie, when, when uh, the X-Men is flying through super, super fast and he's doing all these different things, or the Flash from DC Comics. It is so cool, but it, it slows down. It's your body and your mind's way of coping with the realities of everything going on around you. It's as if time not only stands still, but it lengthens and it stretches. I hope that whoever's in that ambulance or fire truck is all right. I'm sorry for the noise, friends. We ran. I'm not ashamed to say. I'm not a runner, as you can tell. I'm not a track star. But that night I ran faster than Usain Bolt. I have never in my life ran myself that fast. We were all at the same pace. Some of us were sobbing. I was laughing. That's what I do when I get nervous. <laughs> Can't help it. Um, whenever I get in a fight or anything crazy happens, I, I giggle. And um, always have, I guess, and I can't change it, and I wouldn't. It helps me. So at any rate, I'm giggling. And everybody else is sobbing and running. <laughs> but I was right there. And it was, it was a strange type of a terror. It was a terror, but there was also the most terrifying thing to this day. And the thing that bothers me the most is I wanted to go back. I wanted to know. I had to know. 
I have to know! But I didn't. One of my friends is no longer with me that was there that night. And it was always, always our plan that we would go back and prove the existence of what we saw that night. He never got to live to see. He never got to live to see that. I hope to someday maybe, maybe, maybe we will. Maybe that whatever we saw that night is out there. We ran so fast. We ran so fast that uh, those tents that I told you about earlier, those little devil in the detail things, they have these long guidelines that go down to the ground. I can remember the sound of hammers nailing them in after a big wind having to go out and it's part of the reason I always love my hammer. Bam, you go out and whack that thing. You wouldn't even have to bend over. Just take that tent pole and rock it down there. I hit one of those going faster than I'd ever run in my life. I literally hit it. The friends, I tell you, crew, if this is the, the imaginary line like right here, I rolled uh, 20, maybe 30 feet. I hit that thing running at such a clip that when I rolled, I threw my stick, <laughs> remember what I had in my hands, and I just tried to roll, but I didn't do a very good job. I ended up starting off rolling this way, and then I somehow turned sideways, and I hit the picnic table so hard that I could barely breathe for a week. Fairly certain I separated. That's the first time I separated a rib that's always given me trouble with jujitsu and stuff. But I hit the table, and I got up choking and gasping. <gasps> <coughs> <coughs> almost puking in my terror of the moment. By this time, everybody, every scout was waking up. There were lights going on. There were lanterns. The, 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 I can still remember the smell of the burn, the campfire that had burned down. I can remember everything as if it's happening all over again. And our scoutmaster, his name is Dick. He's a wonderful guy. He could sometimes be a real dick, but he's a wonderful guy nonetheless. Um, love you, Dick, if you're watching this. Um, I really do. <laughs> He's a, he was my scoutmaster. He, he never liked to camp there with us, though, so he left his associate, this guy named Junior. To this day, friends, I don't understand. I don't know if Junior's alive. I don't know anything. But Junior was what you might call a little different. He used to regale us with stories of his black Irish temper and beating up police officers on a bender down at the local bar on Bayshore Avenue. He was a real card. But um, I wouldn't have trusted him with my, with my dog, let alone my kids. But there we were under his care that night. And we're all, we're all freaking out. I mean, we had just seen a monster, for all we knew. And I'll never forget the whole camp coming alive. And we got this, this group of all of us that had seen it that night. There were, there were I could name you the names of my friends. Um, Kyle, who's no longer with us. Chris, David, Patrick, and Ross. All of those, those gentlemen, all but one are alive. My friend Kyle is no longer with us. Um, but the rest of them that were there that night were trying to, were shouting over each other what we had seen, what's going on. And they're trying their best. Oh, they're trying their best to calm us down. And we're just not taking the bait. We want the hell out of there. We couldn't get out of there fast enough. Call my parents, please. I'm not spending the night here. Yes, you are. You're stuck in the middle of Camp Miles. There's nowhere for you to go. You're stuck. So what do we do? Well, we pray, we hope, we take our sticks and we sharpen the, tick, the, the, the tips of them and we stick them in the fire to harden up the tip. Somebody had told me that if you urinate on, on a fire hardened stick, it hardens it more. So I would burn my tip and then I would rub it on a rock. You know what I mean? The tip of my stick, this stick, <laughs> my, 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 you know what I mean? Get your minds out of the gutter. This is TikTok, but still, I mean, not, not TikTok. This is YouTube. I'd sharpen the tip, I'd stick it in the fire, and I'd pee on it. It gave me some comfort to know that my tip was fire-hardened if Bigfoot came, or whatever the hell that was. We all went to the same tent that night, all of us, and some of our friends that believed us. We all stayed in the same tent. We literally took a census among ourselves, and we posted guards the rest of the night. Now, this had caused such a commotion. Some of the children, there were two twins, two young boys, and, and a couple others that had to go home because of this, because of this night. They pitched, I'll never forget these two. In fact, I told you earlier about throwing a stick at one. I had, I had, I always had a sharpened stick. It wasn't just because I'd seen that thing. We lived in an area where there's alligators and there's wild pigs. And I've always believed in carrying a good, sturdy, stout stick. So I'd always carried one and we'd have spear chucking competitions. I'm quite good at chucking a spear. I tr trust me when I say I can chuck the hell out of a spear. 
but the two little twins, they got me mixed up. They both looked the same. So I was trying to throw it in between them. They were willing participants, just because they were smaller than me, and they weren't very bright, doesn't mean they weren't willing. And I threw my spear, and the little goblin moved at the last moment. It wasn't my fault. He, he, he literally moved at the very last moment, and I caught him, just barely caught his foot, and he cried and cried and cried, and I wasn't allowed to carry sticks, but I still did it. A little anarchist, I guess. I needed my stick. So that night, we all, well, nobody slept. But this had caused such an uproar. The children had went in. Uh, their parents were forced to come all the way from Naples to get them. They were having panic attacks. A few of the other younger scouts went as well. And I'm thinking, why can't we go? You know, we're trying to hitch a ride. We're trying to get out of there. And they're like, no, no, no. Your parents have to be in, you know, your parents have to be contacted. We have to go up to the office. Or there's people at the office. This is called, the whole camp's come alive. About this time... And this is, the, this is the thing that we've all discussed, and we'll talk about it on the podcast. My friends and I had this experience together. But um, the strange thing is, within an hour of this happening, we hear the first swamp buggy. After the first swamp buggy, within another 20 minutes, the airboats. The whole area was alive with ATVs, four-wheelers, swamp buggies, and everything. We were told by the scoutmaster that we had to stay in our tents. But we were all outside the tents watching all this. You could see the lights going back and forth across the swamp. This is all, friends, I'll tell you, but my friends will tell you the same thing. The whole night was alive. So the whole story, everybody's saying that we saw Bigfoot out there, that, that some scouts saw this. So immediately, one of the elders come down, um, the, the, the people that are the higher-ups that live there, the, the, sta the, the park ranger, there's a park ranger in that neck of the woods too. Park ranger comes out and talks to us. One of the elders comes and talks to us, and they say, look, boys, um, I think what we have here is we have somebody that's tried to pull your leg. We, we, their, their working theory, we had two working theories at that point. I had another one and the other scouts did too, that we saw a monster. But the other ones were that um, they had had people that were dressed up in different Indian regalia, furs and things, and whoever it was was wearing those furs and they tried to scare us and they, they accomplished it. That's what they were thinking. They were so dismissive of it all. And the only other option that they said, one of them said was, they checked with the Octagon, the, 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 the society, the Octagon. It's still there. You can look up the Octagon. They did, in fact, have orangutan at the time. They did have an orangutan, but he was accounted for. So I don't believe that it was an orangutan. I'll tell you what, whatever it was that night has haunted me ever since. It wasn't until years later that I really got a definitive name to go with this. The name is the Skunk Ape. It is the equivalent of the Bigfoot in that neck of the woods. Now, some people don't believe in Bigfoot at all, but people that do believe in Bigfoot believe that they're not all one and the same. The Asian Yaren looks a lot different than, than the, the, the Almasty from Russia, and the Yowie looks different than the Sasquatch from the United States of America. The Yerong Pendok looks a lot different from the Skunk Ape, the Mayaka Skunk Ape, and the, the, the one that I'm telling you about, the real story of the Camp Miles Skunk Ape, the Babcock Camp Skunk Ape. That's the first time I've ever said that. We'll have to come up with something better to call him. But I've never told this story before. My friends, we've told it before in small bits. I've never done it on social media. And my friends are very excited. One of them, a couple of them are kind of like, yeah, we'll come in and we'll talk. Um, some of them want to just be recorded. But I'm going to try to get my best friend in and one of my two best friends in to talk about it. They were there that night. They saw the same things that old creatures saw that night. And uh, they'll tell you true. I'm not pulling your leg. What we saw... You can, you can say whatever you want, and I, I want you to understand this. I'm trying to prove the, the case for the existence of the skunk ape of Bigfoot, but I'm also going to tell you why you shouldn't believe in Bigfoot in just a moment. But first, I think I may need to go and use the restroom. There. I hope the lighting is better now. A few years ago, near Piscataway, New Jersey, I started to receive reports Bigfoot sightings, a rash of them, all at once, lighting up the map, so to speak. I was intrigued, and I was following it very closely. What happened next is hilarious, but it also proves a very good point. Many of the stories that we hear are outright hoaxes. Many of those are cases of mistaken identity. And I want to tell you about one such case involving many such cases of mistaken identity. Well people started seeing Bigfoot in Piscataway, quite often, in fact, in the surrounding, surrounding areas. The 911 dispatches, oh, birdies, it's all right, calm yourselves. The 911 dispatches were getting fed up. 
They were threatening legal action against those calling in a Bigfoot sighting. They were pissed. They were getting them all the time. For about 10 days there, every day they were getting multiple sightings of Bigfoot. Mostly at night, mostly motorists passing through, some people in their backyards, even some security footage of something tall and black and on two legs running across their backyard. Quite intriguing for me. I was very, very interested in it all, so I followed very, very closely. I think our friend might be trying to tell me something. There's a few groups of birds that are focused in on one area. Um, at any rate, it wasn't until a state trooper saw Bigfoot right there in the middle of his headlamps on patrol that anybody took him seriously. He called him to dispatch and said, you're not going to believe this. The state trooper called in and said, you're not going to believe this. I just saw an effing Bigfoot. Not long after that, they caught Bigfoot, friends. They surely did. But it wasn't what they expected him to be. Bigfoot was a large male American black bear. His front legs had become crippled in some snare or trap. He couldn't use them, you see. So he walked around on his back legs and he was thriving stealing bird seed in the night, stealing neighborhood dogs' food out of their bowl, cat kibble, trash, whatever he could get into, into the city. He was thriving and surviving. There's no giving these animals, friends. They don't just decide, oh, I'm wounded, I'm gonna give up and die. They find a way to live, and that old Bruin did, and he shocked everyone. You know the most amazing thing about these sightings, just about two of me, to a man and a woman and a child? They described something very unbear-like when they told the story. Bear in mind, their minds had no point of reference. So when they saw this thing in the middle of the road in their headlamps, a large, seven foot, eight foot tall, black being walking or shambling or running on two legs across the road at a good clip of speed, what do you suppose you would think? You, know, you might know and go, oh, I would think it's a bear. I'm around bears all the time. Well, so were a lot of those people. New Jersey is the garden state after all. And they know what a bear looks like. The state trooper, when he described what he saw, he described hands, like ours, with fingernails and everything. A flat, pushed-in nose and a face very much like ours. Very unbear-like. They have a muzzle, after all, and it's a longer muzzle, full of sharp teeth. But this thing sure didn't, if you heard him tell the story. So, mistaken identity, outright hoaxes. If you tell me a thousand stories and I throw away 997 of those, I'm left with three amazing stories left behind. Should we cover one of those, you think? I'd like to tell you the story, the Appalachian story of Bigfoot and the Mountain Doctor. This happened in a small town called Balsam Grove, North Carolina, in Transylvania County, in the mountains of Western North Carolina not too far from the French Broad River. It's a beautiful area. I would imagine even more so back then. It's still very sparsely populated and it has some amazing features. There's a military bunker there and there's some strangeness in Balsam Grove. Stories of UFOs and aliens and all types of stuff. Some real stranger things type things happen there in the Balsam Grove. You should look it up if you haven't heard of it already. The military does claim that they have an, uh, a military installation there. But this is a long time before Uncle Sam got his mitts on that neck of woods. This is when the Foxfire books were written on. The olden days, when the families were very poor, very hardworking folk. They kept a farm in the mountains. They grew vegetables and they kept a hog fattened up to keep them in meat throughout the winter. If they were wealthy, they had a dairy cow. They had a couple of dogs for hunting the local possum and squirrels and wildlife that all made their way to their table. Beautiful turkey, black bear, a number of other things, even mountain lions, some say. 
It was a beautiful and idyllic life in some ways, but very, very hard in others. There was just one doctor, and you can read about this man if you look up the book Mountain Doctor, based in Balsam Grove in Rosman, North Carolina. You'll hear of him, and you might even be able to find an old copy of his story. But you probably won't hear about this one, or the bear attack, or any of the others. This is a story that was told to me by a neighbor and a very close friend of his. Oh, and back uh, 2001, I guess, when I first got to Brevard, North Carolina, to go to college at Brevard College. And it was there that I heard this story, and I was transfixed, and I always have been. You see, the mountain doctor himself was not a teller of tall tales. He was a down-to-earth, salt-of-the-earth type of guy. He was poor. Back then, to be a doctor meant that you traveled great distances um, for very little pay. Many times, it was just for some chickens or some potatoes or whatever produce they were able to grow or some fresh cheese or milk. You did it because you were a healer and you were a doctor and you wanted to save lives. To practice in those mountains was tough. You didn't have automobiles, dear friends, not back then. You traveled with a horse and a mule carrying your things. That's what you carried. That's what you used. And it was one day on his trail going to a very sick person that he believed might have had tuberculosis, he later said. And as he was on his way, in all haste, he heard something in the distance. Well, at first, his horse had spooked and heard something in the distance. Something, it seemed, was following them. Now, the mountain doctor was prepared, if you know what I mean. He had the old iron on his hip. Everybody was armed back then. You traveled through these woods, there were things out there that might gobble you up, even other people. And he thought possibly it was some people, maybe some people that were addicted to laudanum or drugs or wanted him for his money. <laughs> the joke was on them. He didn't have much of that. He never carried any. He never got any for his services. And he was on his way as fast as he could, so he wasn't going to stop and worry about anything. He was going. And then his horse stopped in its tracks and balked, and the mule began to fuss. If you've ever heard an angry mule, you'll know it. All right, that just sounds like a hammer, I think. Or is it a tree knock? Wouldn't that be delightful, eh? At any rate... There's the doctor on his trip, and his horse and his mule are freaking out, and he knows not what it is. He thinks it could be a bear, it could be wild dogs, it could even be a snake that he spooked. And the horses are spooked because of the snake. But he strained, and he heard nothing. It was at that special time between dusk and, and full dark that you could still see fairly well. He was in a hurry, he was engaged in trying to save lives, and he also wanted to get to the homestead before late, by God. Who wants to be trapped out and spend the night in the middle of the woods if they can help it? He wanted to get to where there was fire and there was light and possibly a meal for his hungry tummy. Who wouldn't want that? And then he heard it. Something with a deep stentorian growl came off in the direction of the woods. His immediate thought was bear. But then he saw it there in the dark. It was no bear. It was a gigantic man, or so he said, covered in a beautiful pelt of fur. And it looked at him and looked at his horses and took a step towards the horses as if it was coming for them. And he pulled his sidearm and he took aim. And he just about fired, but he held the trigger. He said when he pulled the gun, whatever this thing was, it recognized the danger and it stopped itself. He said at first it seemed like it was overcome by either curiosity and then the curiosity turned to almost like a bloodlust when it saw the horses that thought food, maybe something they were carrying or maybe the horses or even him. But... It was aware, friends. It was aware of the danger that his gun presented that was aimed directly between its eyes. The creature gave an angry puff, almost like a snort, and turned on its heels. And he said, in a very angry, shuffling way, ran off into the woods. He heard it two or three times in the distance. He was shocked, to say the least. When his horses were under control and he was able to take and assess the situation, his training took over, you see. He never doubted that what he saw was an animal rather than a person. He said that he thought, believe it or not, based on his education, that it was a great ape. Oh, mountain doctor, how I love you. There is something in these woods. I've told you of our tree knocker and sometimes the strange noises that I hear. The weirdest one is the honking, and I, I know this one's going to sound strange. I'm, I'm seriously hoping that you'll share this to other people that love Bigfoot. And maybe one of those people 
Even if it's just this clip, somebody will know about the honking noise that I hear. It, it seems as if there's something in these woods that almost sounds like it's a... You know those old beluga horns on the bicycles, the old swims, you know? Honk! It's like that, but much deeper. Like a honk! And it's the weirdest, it sounds like a jumped up, jacked up bullfrog on steroids. But it, it couldn't be the way that it moves and the way that the sound travels and carries. It's, it's big, whatever it is. It's no night bird, nothing that I've ever heard. Hello, little one. There you are. Hmm, what could it be? Some people have speculated that Bigfoot could be a relic population of early hominid. Whether something like Gigantopithecus or something like Homo floriensis, the Hobbit of Flores. Or maybe something that's heretofore undiscovered by science. Something very much like us. Something as smart, or maybe even smarter than us. That is able to reason like us, but still has the instincts of a wild thing. Then there's the other theories that Bigfoot is not a real flesh and blood being at all, that he's a time traveler, that he can step between galaxies, that he can move from universe to universe with the greatest of ease, that he is a spirit given form, that he is some form of skinwalker, Nagaloshi, a Rougarou, something that can change into its larger form, but also can look like us. And that guess is as good as any. Next, we'll probably talk about werewolves and lycanthropes. For every story of a werewolf, friends, there's a story of a wolf were, of a creature that's able to take a man form. What if we've been looking in all the wrong places? You do remember Coco, the talking gorilla, don't you? Something, something's just not quite right with Coco. If you're watching this, Coco, I know what you are and you know what I am. Let's talk. Ooh, if you would like to hear more of these stories, let me know in the comments if you would enjoy werewolves for Halloween or vampires or anything. Please, let me know. And if you haven't subscribed yet, you're not following me here or TikTok or any of the other places. What's keeping you? 